Bad visual effects. Love them, hate them, delightfully cursed or just distracting, they can show up anywhere at any time. Seriously, you're only a few short minutes away even now from being attacked by the CGI rock from The Mummy Returns. Look at him. So squidgy, oh my poor sweet boy. But not every bad effect is immediately as noticeable as the Scorpion King. A dodgy animatronic, incomplete CGI, or a shoddy miniature may go unnoticed if it only appears for a split second. If shoddy SFX are lurking in the background, then they can also be easily missed. But once seen, there's no unseeing it. So I'm Ewan, this is What Culture, and here are 10 terrible special effects in movies you didn't catch the first time. Number 10. Pippin's All Dolled Up. The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. Few movie franchises have pushed special effects more than Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings. Though Gollum's design is the trilogy's greatest technological achievement, the SFX team deserves heavy praise for its work on the Hobbit scenes. For these scenes, the crew used force perspective, digital scaling, and dwarf stand-ins to make the diminutive creatures look much shorter than the actors playing them. And other times, the Hobbits were portrayed by dolls. Although this tactic sounds maybe a little bit amateur, it's pretty unnoticeable so long as the Hobbit figurines aren't facing the camera. However, it's a different story altogether during the Return of the King's climax, when one of the dolls can be seen as clear as day. When the black gates open during the final battle, the camera fixates on Aragorn after he's done his whole for Frodo thing and it's just the best thing ever. But if our eyes haphazardly veer off course towards Pippin in the background, it's evident that the young hobbit is a puppet. Oh, what horrors he has seen. Number 9. Donatello's Other Mouth Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 1990. By today's standards, the animatronics in 1990's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are still mind-blowing. Even though it was a Krangian task to nail the look of the heroes in a half shell, I'm making Krangian a word if it isn't already, Jim Henson's workshop pulled it off with flying colors. Like, genuinely, the 1990 TMNT movie is one of the greatest comic book movies of all time. Just look at Elias Katias as stupid sexy Casey Jones if you don't believe me. However, as much as the movie itself is fantastic, that doesn't mean it's technically flawless. In certain scenes, the puppeteer's heads are fully visible. After Raphael crashes through the ceiling, his body squishes down when his brothers touch him, proving that he's obviously in a big old rubber suit. A stuntman's hand can also be seen when Donatello skates through the sewer tunnel. However, there's one special effect blooper that isn't just bad, but is also kind of nightmare fuely. After Raph wakes up in the bath, Don cracks a joke while standing beside April O'Neil. Don opens his mouth so wide, though, that the stuntman's jaws are momentarily visible. Out of context, it appears as if the lovable turtle has eaten some poor wayward human who's letting out an agonizing scream just before being swallowed whole. Number eight, eye opener. Blade Trinity. Wesley Snipes' alleged on-set behavior during Blade Trinity has become the stuff of legend. Throughout production, it was reported that the action star refused to speak to the actors or crew, smoked weed in his trailer while his standard performed the majority of the scenes, and tried to strangle the director, David S. Goya, on their first meeting. However, the pettiest moment occurred while filming the morgue sequence. The scene opens with Blade supposedly dead while lying on an autopsy table. After a group of doctors enter the room, the vampire slayer wakes up and begins attacking them. In essence, the scene couldn't have been simpler, especially since Snipes' stuntman ostensibly did most of the work. But due to his strenuous relationship with Goya, Snipes refused to open his eyes, jeopardizing the scene in question. Left with no other choice, CGI eyes were inserted over the lead star's eyelids, giving us this. Now, that is hating on a level we can all aspire to be on. Number seven, the janky elf. The Polar Express. Now, it would be kind to say that motion capture hadn't been perfected back when Robert Zemeckis decided to utilize the technology for the Polar Express, aka Winter Hell Train to Demon Land. For this reason, the character's unnatural facial expressions and dead-eyed gaze received a hefty amount of criticism when it first released. But considering mocap was in its infancy at the time, the Polar Express is still a visual marvel to behold, if you're hardwired in a certain way. 
which I am not. This thing looks terrifying to me. Having said that, there's one digital effect that's pretty inexcusable. As the titular train arrives at the North Pole, Hero Boy is in awe when he sees countless elves dancing, frolicking, and cartwheeling beside the station. This is meant to be a magical moment, since it proves that Hero Boy was wrong for doubting the existence of Santa Claus. Magic, wonder, and hold on, also for elves who move without moving? Question mark? Yeah, get a load of this guy. Although they're moving, the whimsical creature's body is completely stiff. Almost as if he's sliding across the floor like some kind of cursed Gary's mod character model. There are dozens of elves in the shot, so this blunder is pretty unnoticeable unless you're doing the whole Will Graham from Hannibal thing and forensically studying each frame of the Polar Express, which I don't think any of us are, so swiftly moving on. Number six. The Rigged Staircase, A Nightmare on Elm Street. In Wes Craven's 80s classic, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Nancy Thompson finds herself being pursued by a dream demon called Freddy Krueger every time she goes to sleep. Freddy can control the dream world any way he sees fit, allowing the fedora-wearing maniac to toy with Nancy while she's having 40 winks. Great movie with some great, great imagery. Permanently etched the idea of long arms being terrifying to me. I mean, look at him. Yeah, get those arms away, Fred, you freaky man. Despite the somewhat minimal budget of the movie, A Nightmare on Elm Street churned out some awesome special effects, especially the blood geyser sequence, which still holds up to this day. But some visuals didn't turn out as well as they could have. During one sequence, where Nancy is trying to evade Freddy by running up the stairs, Freddy uses his powers to melt the steps, causing our heroine to momentarily get stuck in the staircase. This special effect was achieved by placing pre-cut holes inside certain steps and then covering them with a viscous fabric. It's a pretty shocking moment the first time around, since you don't know what to expect. But on a rewatch, viewers will be looking at the staircase more attentively. As such, they might happen to see the fabric over the pre-cut holes, and that it doesn't match the shape, color, or texture as the rest of the steps. Again, this doesn't ruin anything. Why on earth would we doubt the master that was Wes Craven? But still, a cool bit of movie magic that you get to see before your eyes if you're looking closely enough. Number five, what a dummy. Spider-Man. You know, I'm something of a special effects nitpicker myself. While a technical marvel on most accounts, even the biggest fans of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, and that's me, if you doubt my credentials, you can challenge me to an emo jazz bar dance-off anytime, place, will be aware of a few effects sequences that haven't held up especially well. In one scene, where Tobey Maguire's Spidey and Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin are soaring through the air, it's pretty obvious that they've been CGI'd, since their movements appear floaty and abnormal, and the models themselves have that delicious early 2000s CG sheen. However, one of the movie's funniest flubs wasn't a digital effect, but rather a practical one. After our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man rescues Mary Jane Watson for the first time, played by Kirsten Dunst, of course, he swings across the city before safely placing her down. Ah, <sighs> there he goes. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, friendly neighborhood. Wait a minute, that isn't Spider-Man at all. It's a mannequin. On a serious note, you really have to be fixated on Spidey to see this, and again, it really doesn't matter. But still, one of those can't unsee effects you'll be carrying with you into every rewatch going forward, so sorry. Number four, The Shape's Mask. Halloween H2O, 20 years later. Anyone who knows me knows I love Halloween. John Carpenter is my fave of all time, and I've been hearing Michael Myers breathing in my head at one moment or another now for about 20 years. Although, I should probably get that checked out and I verbalized that out loud. Anyway, despite the OG Halloween being one of the greatest horror movies ever made, its sequels came nowhere near. With among the worst, and yes, I am saying these are worse than the Cold of Thorn movies, are Halloween H2O and Halloween Resurrection. The former is the focus of the goofy effect of this entry though, and it's once again down to Michael Myers' bloody mask, which every film after Halloween 2 just could not get right. 
In one particular shot, Michael's mask doesn't just look bad, but kind of off. During production, the actor playing Michael wore a facial covering called the KNB mask. Believing Michael didn't look intimidating enough, his scenes were reshot with a better designed mask. However, the filmmakers forgot to swap the mask in the scene where the silent serial killer confronts Charlie, creating a continuity error. To get around this, a CGI mask was placed over Michael's face, and look at it. Just, just look at it. I've always described H2O's Michael as walking around like a guy that's had a bathroom accident in public, but oh my god. The mask does not make things better in any way, shape, or form. Number three, reverse waterfall, Anaconda. Don't go chasing waterfalls unless you're the crew of Anaconda, evidently. Thanks to the dumb lines, cheesy characters, and John Voight's preposterous performance, Anaconda is thoroughly entertaining for all the gloriously 90s reasons you're probably already thinking of. It also isn't without its technical qualities. The effects, generally speaking, hold up quite well. And since CGI was still a relatively new tool in movie making at the time, the titular snake could have looked ridiculous. But for all the film's faults, the slithering serpent turned out great. And although the visual crew did a terrific job on the hardest special effect, they somehow screwed up the easiest one. In the scene where Jennifer Lopez's Terry tends to the critically ill Dr. Kale, played by Eric Stoltz, there's a shot of the boat sailing away across the river. For some reason, this sequence was filmed with the boat sailing in the opposite direction, but was reversed during post-production. This editing trick wouldn't have been apparent if the boat wasn't beside a waterfall. Since the footage has been flipped, the waterfall appears to be flowing upward. Though Anaconda has many scenes that defy logic, this is the only moment in the movie that defies physics. Except John Voight's accent, that, that thing definitely defies the rules of science in one way or another. Number two, shape-shifting Anakin Skywalker. Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. For a long time, the words excessive CGI were synonymous with the Star Wars prequels. Though Revenge of the Sith is regarded as the strongest entry of the trilogy, and genuinely it should be the Phantom Menace, just saying, it might have the strangest and most unnecessary special effect in the whole franchise. While attending the opera, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, Ian McDermott, regales Hayden Christensen's Anakin Skywalker with a story of Darth Plagueis the Wise. It's a fascinating scene of real high point for the prequels, since it's the closest that Star Wars ever comes to really properly exploring Palpatine's murky backstory. Due to the intriguing tale and McDermott's effortless charisma, I mean, just look at that gaze, man. Whoa. All eyes should be laser focused on the duplicitous Sith in question. But if viewers watch Anakin when Palpatine utters the words, then his apprentice killed him in his sleep, they'll see the young Jedi Knight morph before their very eyes. The shift is subtle, but there's no question George Lucas merged two takes of Christensen together during the shot, since his head position, hair, and the lighting visibly warp. If Lucas had just left the shot alone, it would have been fine, but I'm not gonna criticize him. You do what you want, George, you wonderful, crazy, lovely guy. And number one, backwards muzzle flash. Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. When a movie shootout requires dozens of actors, long shots, and complex choreography, there are times when it's more sensible to use digital effects for gunfire. Even though CGI can sometimes get a bad rap, digital muzzle flashes shouldn't be distracting, since they only appear for a split second and should look convincing enough if the actors are simulating recoil and impact effectively. Unfortunately, something went horribly wrong when this trick was used in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. During the the iconic nightmare sequence, the Cape Crusader faces off against a horde of armed soldiers. At first, nothing seems out of the ordinary. The sequence is shot well, it's visually striking, and the choreography is pretty fluid. But when Bat strikes a soldier while firing his gun, the muzzle flash comes out of the barrel backwards. Because of this, it looks like there's an invisible gun to Batman's right, shooting into the soldier's weapon. If the muzzle flash only occurred once, the scene might have gotten away 
away with it. But since the flash effect appears no less than three times, it becomes extremely distracting once it's spotted. This is obviously far from the worst thing about Batman v Superman, but still, a weirdly minor effect that is really weird for actually making it into the final cut.